there were just a few things that I thought, gosh, if I could just um, sit down with pastors, pastors' wives, ministry leaders, there are about three things that I think are super, super important. So many things that are important, but three that I think have impacted our ministry um, in, a, in a unique way. So yeah, and, and pastors these days face such unique challenges, ministry leaders, not just pastors, unique challenges. And so I was super motivated to, to um, sit down and, and have share a few, a few thoughts, even though it's not really my thing to sit down and share my thoughts in a, a, in, with a big group of people. All right, Sandra, with that, I know that you had three main wishes for pastors and leaders in ministry. And the first wish was really related to our personal walks with God, which, you know, just, I mean, I've been in ministry for close to 25 years. Now, I think the assumption is from somebody looking from the outside in uh, to a pastor's life, they might think, well, you, you, this is, this is just kind of an assumption right, that your walk right. with You're God is healthy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So uh, why do we need to be considering this as leaders in the church? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the first wish was simply that your faith and your personal walk with God would be authentic. And I think the key word, Tony, is authentic. Um, the question I like to ask is, how is your intimacy with God really? You know, putting that really on there, it just makes us stop and pause and go, okay, how is it really? Um, I think as ministry folks, we are most set up for faking it because we feel like we have a lot to lose. And, um, you know, here's something you already know. Intimacy with our Heavenly Father stays authentic when we prioritize our time alone with Him, when we renew our minds and our hearts in His Word, and when we commune with Him privately in the regular rhythm of our everyday. And, and I think that regular rhythm of our everyday part is so important. So are we doing these things really? Or has our quiet time turned into sermon prep time? That's always a temptation, I think, for any of us who are developing outlines and, you know, Sunday's coming, Sunday's coming, Sunday's coming. There's a sermon that has to happen or a talk that has to be prepared. So, you know, has your quiet time turned into sermon prep time? Has your prayer defaulted to just asking God for a message or for new opportunities? And, you know, there's nothing wrong with any of those things, but when those things replace that time that is meant for us deepening our intimacy with God, um, that's the miss. And it's so easy to drift from that. Um, and here's how I know that authentic faith and real intimacy with God is so important. Even Jesus, who was fully God and fully man, regularly pulled away from the crowds and from his followers and from his inner circle to be alone with his heavenly father. Um, as we look into scripture, you know, twice in Mark, twice in Luke, and once in Matthew, these gospel writers tell us that while it was still dark, Jesus withdrew to quiet places to pray. And um, my favorite one is Mark 135. I love it because there are just, there's so many, so many more details in this one. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, he left the house, and he went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And I, I don't know about you, but this is so powerful to me, knowing that Jesus Christ, who is the son of God, the second person of the Trinity, felt compelled to draw away for time alone with his heavenly father. It just reminds me of my need, my extraordinary need as a frail, messy you know, human person who can be so incredibly short-sighted at times, um, you know, it just reminds me of my need. And I think regardless of season, and it looks very different in different seasons, especially for us moms, um, my quiet time, my time alone with the Lord has looked different in different seasons of life. Um, but regardless, it is so important to figure out how to pull away in with regular rhythm to have that time alone with our heavenly father, because for us in ministry, um, not only do we just love God, there's a lot at stake and our intimacy with God is so important. If we want to have a, a, an enduring, you know, ministry where we're leading other people to have this intimacy with God as well. 
All right. So the second uh, thought was around humility. And uh, what struck me, Sandra, is I think outside the church space, we see so few examples in these days about leaders that are leading with humility. And so I just thought, well, this is a season where I really need to be reminded that this needs to be a priority in my life as well. I mean, do you agree? Right. Uh, absolutely. 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 Um, yeah. My second wish was simply that we would pursue humility. I, I think it's possible that we live in a place on the continuum of time that is the most self-centered it's ever been. Um, again, you know, we count followers and friends on social media. Sometimes we judge our personal success on those numbers or on the what people say about us. Um, we often posture our posts, you know, to make ourselves look uh, more successful or more powerful or whatever adjective it is that we crave in that moment. And all of that is in direct conflict with a call to pursue humility. And I say pursue humility because I think we have to fight for it. I think it's a constant effort. And if it's going to be true of us, we have to continually pursue it. Um, a few years ago, I read a book that I have just loved by a guy named J.R. Vassar called Glory Hunger. And um, our small group actually went through it earlier this year because it's it's just such a powerful book. Um, I think everybody in ministry ought to read it. But th here's a quote that just stopped me in my tracks um, from that book. And the quote goes like this. When we, like Jesus, love what is most lovely and value what is supremely valuable, and glorify most what is most glorious, we will begin to experience freedom from the crippling concern of glorifying ourselves. I love that last phrase, the crippling concern of glorifying ourselves. That's just, that's just amazing to me. I agree. And uh, with this uh, topic of humility, I've, I've heard you talk about this dichotomy really between humility and entitlement. And I think this, again, is especially important for uh, those of us that lead in ministry. Can you unpack that thought a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, something that Andy said a while back when he was speaking to a big group of leaders that, that really struck me is entitlement starts somewhere. Entitlement starts somewhere. I think it's easy um, to think that we're the exception to this because we're Christians and we have a Savior that we obviously elevate above everything else. So maybe we don't notice it when entitlement begins sort of creeping into our lives. Um, but entitlement starts somewhere and it usually starts really small. So it can be pretty insidious and, and catch us by surprise. But um, <clears throat> a couple of decades ago, a mentor of Andy's who had been in ministry for a lot of years. He was further down the road in ministry than we were. And he recognized that Andy was gaining some influence as a pastor and that his reach was beginning to broaden. And he said, Andy, whatever you do, don't swallow the strange pills. And we, we have <laughs> laughed about that because he explained that historically, in, in his experience at least, as leaders' influence begins to escalate, they tend to get weird. And they tend to get entitled. And he mm. referred to it as swallowing the strange pills. And he said, Andy, just pay attention to that and don't get sucked in um, to that way of thinking. And so when in talking to that group of leaders that you mentioned earlier, I talked about swallowing the strange pills. And, and just from our experience in ministry and some of the things that we've seen, I, and I'm sure you've seen gosh, so much of this as well. I gave a few ideas of um, how I feel like we can, as ministry leaders, pursue humility and not swallow the strange pills. So I gave this list of things, and I think that may be why um, your friend uh, mentioned, uh, yeah, mentioned this, yeah. this so idea. Can you get, yeah. can you yeah. get into some so, of those specifics? Yeah, I will, and feel free to, um, to chime in. But the first one is, as ministry leaders, don't set yourself up to be treated differently than the other people around you. And mm. don't let your staff push you to that either. I think that mm. happens a lot. You know, a, a pastor or a ministry leader starts escalating in their influence and having great opportunities and all of that kind of stuff. And, and sometimes it's their staff that pushes them to 
swallow the strange pills. And so um, that was the first thing is, you know, just don't set yourself up to be treated differently and don't let your staff push you toward that either. Um, the set, the other thing, another thing that in my little list was make sure you surround yourself with real friends who will say the hard things to you. And, um, it needs to be people that are not on your payroll. So, you know, real friends around us is huge, really huge. Um, one of the things that we've done over the years that we've just learned is helpful with this is we have never not been in a small group with people in our same season of life that are tracking with us and that know us and that are invited to say something when they see something for you know lack of a better way to say it. So I think surrounding ourselves with real friends is huge. A couple of other things, um, don't climb up when people put a pedestal in front of you. That's, you know, just, that's gonna happen. And again, to your point, it doesn't matter the size of the church. When you're a leader, these things are just going to happen as, as you begin to have some influence in your own community. Um, if you're a church leader, don't let your church or the people in your church give you cars or houses or lots to build a house on or any kind of personal wealth. Um, as weird as that sounds to people who are not in ministry, that happens all the time. And that's something you got to learn to say no to. Um, right off the bat when the when the stakes are smaller because as they get bigger um, it's it's just a real thing as weird as it sounds um, other thing is there's this growing movement toward an honor culture where pastors are treated differently or people stand up when they walk in the room and um, you know my my advice is don't get sucked into that no matter how the people around you try to sell it to you um, you know when I when I look and see how Jesus modeled his New Testament ethic for us in scripture, that is absolutely counter to, um, to anything that we see. You know, he was so clear, um, so clear in our mission, and that is to serve and not be served. And that honor culture really, um, I think, pushes us in, in the opposite direction, to be served rather than to serve. Very good. All right. So we've talked about the first two wishes. One was around our personal walks with God. And the second one was about pursuing humility. What was that third wish that you had for pastors and ministry leaders? Yeah, the third wish was simply that you would get help with anything in your past or your present that has the potential to hold you back. Um, one of the ways that we kind of say it is your past will sneak into your present and it will impact your future. The hard things that we're dealing with presently in our life also have the potential to derail our future. Um, our past hurts, our past unforgiveness, it'll get all over the people in our present, whether that's our staff or the people around us or whether it's our kids and it will impact their futures. Um, one of the things that I've heard people preach on a thousand times, and it can mean a lot of different things, is our root determines our fruit. And I think it applies here because whatever our actions or our reactions or our behaviors are rooted in will in many ways impact the fruit of our lives. And, you know, for some people in ministry, heavy, hard things have happened in their pasts. And their actions and their reactions and their words and their responses continue to be rooted in that. And we've seen that manifest in heartbreaking ways. Um, and while, you know, I think a lot of us feel like, gosh, I would just like to close my eyes to that and move on. It's just not possible. And whatever we have to do to dislodge and deal with that stuff we're carrying, we have to do it. There's no shame in it. And I'm grateful we live in a time when it's so acceptable um, to get emotionally and mentally and mentally healthy. So um, don't carry the hard stuff around on your own. That's so good. And uh, I just, I, this has just been so helpful, Sandra. So uh, thank you for sharing all of these words of encouragement, but any final thoughts that you want to leave pastors and ministry leaders? Um, one of my seminary professors, John Hanna, um, said this about ministry. I, I love this. He says, we don't claim credit for what we do. We get on our knees and we thank God for letting us do it. And so yeah, I think my final thought would be 
we are just um, doing a job that is such a privilege and it matters for eternity. And we can just be so grateful that God lets us do it.